Oh, yeah. It's all coming together. Amphibia Season 3, Episode 4, Fight at the Museum in Temple Frogs, sees the gang finally get the ball rolling with their quest back home, as they make new allies, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with killer robots, and decode an ancient message from a familiar face. As always, we're going to run through this episode for all of the details you may have missed. And to stay in the loop of all things Amphibia during our Season 3 coverage, please be sure to subscribe to the roundtable with notifications on so you never miss a video. Alright, let's get this show on the road, starting with Fight at the Museum. We open with Anne pulling an all-nighter as she's dedicated to researching ways to get the planters home through means of a portal, which leads to several parodies of real-world websites and the e-culture that surrounds them. The Return of Dougal, a straight-to-the-point parody of Google, Woohoo Queries, a parody of Yahoo Answers, which recently shut down this past May. Press F to pay respects. One of the users typing a response is xxm underscore bxx, a not to series creator Matt Brawley. Big ol' wiki, a parody of Wikipedia, with the page open on the multiverse. And fun fact, this page is just an abridged version of the real Wikipedia's page for the multiverse. Almost word for word, just trimmed down a bit. And play button tube. Nah, I'm pretty sure this is still pronounced YouTube. At first it may look like Anne got derailed from her initial agenda, and stumbled down the rabbit hole of AnnieTube, watching a content creator named Amy Chan, who has over a million subscribers. Get that bread. However, this video is a proclaimed realistic guide to isekai anime. Isekai Kai being the subgenre of anime where a character is transported to another world. It's why I call Amphibia and Owl House Disney Esekai. And that's when you realize Anne's desperation and Gen Z intuition has driven her to someone's thoughts on a realistic means to travel to another world when writing fanfiction. The struggle is real, folks. Amy Chan also has an apology video, whoops, which is the one set to play next. The crew definitely knows how the YouTube game works. The top 10 anime opening thumbnail features Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen, and we also see a smidge of the thumbnail for the iconic Lo-Fi Beats Girl. Last but not least, Anne is on a traditional web forum, prepared to publish a new thread in her question, but is interrupted by her mom demanding her presence. In the living room, Anne speculates on the existence of a second Calamity Box, which I believe to be foreshadowing to some degree. Even if a second box doesn't exist, Anne is in position of the skip man from the creator's Curiosity Hut, which is a music player, and she has Calamity energy lying dormant within her, which could be used to supercharge a machine that's capable of creating a portal home. Anne's not insane for wanting to consult every thrift store in a 50-mile radius either, as excessive as it sounds, since we know a book of information on the Calamity Box is at the local library. On top of the main conflict of this episode, it's reasonable to assume other artifacts and resources from Amphibia could be scattered all over Los Angeles. We learn that Anne has to make up for all the schoolwork she missed when she was in Amphibia, which raises a few questions, although one of these questions is answered in Temple Frogs. But how many people in the school, either as faculty or students, are aware of Anne's return? Have Sasha and Marcy's parents been contacted at all? Is Anne allowed to do her work from home until the family informs the school that she feels ready to return? I'm sure we're going to get a better idea of everything as the season progresses, but let me know your thoughts on these questions in the comments down below. Silver Frobo returns as it continues its hunt for Anne, but it's no longer able to track her by the energy signature. Perhaps because Anne's avoiding the usage of her powers, and unlike in the new normal, it's been numerous days since she's tapped into them, whereas in the season premiere, she just turned into Super Anne the day prior. Or maybe because because Anne slugged the robot so hard, it no longer retains the initial energy signature scanned from the gem. Either way, the robot resorts to tracking Anne and the planters through frequencies, hacking into a nearby cell tower, which is terrifying. We know simple things like magnets can disrupt his cloaking ability, so we know there's vulnerabilities, but the upper hand it has over most Earth technology makes me very curious on how all this is going to go down when Andreas launches his invasion. A gag declares Hop Hop as a flat earther, and given that all we've seen of Amphibia is a giant lily pad shaped continent, I don't know if I can blame him. Now we get into the meat of the episode, as Anne and the planters encounter a pot with an interesting design. One that depicts Andreas' friend, the Pink Frog, coming to Earth with a Calamity Box during the Viking era. While I believe this frog is a planter, I no longer believe she's Sprig's mom, due to the reveal that Andreas has been alive for over a thousand years, which was the gap of time between losing the box and the events of the series. Still, True Colors alluded to her being the culprit behind stealing the box and bringing it to Earth, which is now confirmed here, and something we speculated last year on the channel. How long this frog went on to live for, if she had any offspring on Earth, or how the box and other artifacts relating to Amphibia ended up in Los Angeles are all questions that are running through my head, and I need answers stat. 
We're also introduced to Dr. Jan, voiced by Annika Nani Rose, one of the many important brand new human characters from the season 3 opening, who's set to play a large role in season 3's overarching story, and she shares voice actresses with Tiana from The Princess and the Frog, so she has experience in animated projects with amphibians. Just saying. Dr. Jan has an affinity for the supernatural and the unknown, eager to learn more about anything she can. Catboy Hop Hop makes an appearance. No particular reason I bring this up, it just made me happy. Sprig takes out the surveillance cameras, which enables Super Frobo to track them down. Again, that's terrifying. And although there won't be any proof of Anne and the Planters stealing the pot or their brawl with Super Frobo, there's still proof of Sprig attacking the camera with his elongated tongue. I think that footage is going to resurface as a string of evidence and slip ups that the FBI amasses against the Planters. Remember, they're now officially referred to by a character as frog shaped aliens, which I guess isn't wrong? But being identified as extraterrestrial life is grounds for the government to pull up and get involved. I love the shot of Anne evading all of Super Frobo's deadly laser beams. Really great character acting. These shots aren't easy to pull off, and they really nailed it. Animation-wise, it's these little moments that stick with me. Hop Hop reminds us all to eat the rich, which is a voice clip I can already tell the internet is going to get a lot of mileage out of. Anne goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Silver Frobo, utilizing a sword of a blue crystal on the hill, which calls to mind the imagery of the grand prophecy we see at the end of the theme song. Anne's pose is even identical to how she's depicted in the prophecy, just a little easter egg to preface for the end, which gets closer by the week. Silver Frobo loses an arm in the battle, which we know will lead to his construction-based repair in next week's episode, and Sterminator, and the severed arm will wind up in the possession of the Doc Ock-like villain in Spider Spring. So much is happening, and I unapologetically love it. After Silver Frobo retreats in the gang is caught red-handed, Dr. Jan helps cover up their tracks and joins the team, eager to be a valued ally for Anne and the Planters. Hop Hop suggests it might be time to start trusting other people, which sets the stage for the abundance of new characters we're set to be introduced to, and I can't wait. In a move that Dipper from Gravity Falls would think of, Anne suggests shining a black light on the pot for any secret codes, which Dr. Jan goes for the following day, and discovers that there is indeed a hidden message, which we have the tools to decipher, but we're given the answer in the next episode anyways. Temple Frogs! Picking up immediately after fight at the museum, Temple Frogs opens with Anne being contacted by Dr. Jan to meet her at the museum, after the doctor's incredible discovery at the end of the previous segment. But Mrs. Boonchoy has other plans, sweeping Anne and the planters off to the Thai Temple for the monthly community day. This temple in particular is the Wat Thai Temple in Los Angeles. Like many things in Season 3, this episode draws a lot of cultural details from reality. It's great that they're using this season as a vehicle for educating viewers on Thai culture to sort of walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Before they depart, however, students from Anne's school, Desi and Rico, are seen taking photos of her outside of her home. Anne refers to them as gossip bloggers from the school paper, pursuing Anne due to her status as the girl who went missing. They're leaning more and more into Anne, Marcy, and Sasha's disappearance every episode, which I love to see, and I'm very curious on what the payoff will be. Considering Anne avoids addressing Marcy and Sasha, I think this may come back into play as her peers begin to demand answers. Could you imagine Anne being the top suspect in a murder case, pinned as the one responsible for Sasha and Marcy's disappearance? At the Thai Temple, Hop Hop's drawn to cone dancing due to his aspirations as an actor. I love how often Hop Hop's desire as a performer comes up in the show, and with the abundance of death flags that surround his head, maybe he'll end up just playing dead. A believable fake-out for the characters and the audience, before a surprise comeback. Elsewhere in the city, Sewer Frobo is already bouncing back, with the revelation that it's able to deploy dragonfly drones from its body, just like the Mecha Serenum Toad that attacked Wartwood in Turning Point. Which really adds to how powerful Andreas' robots truly are. They not only have their own arsenal of weapons, but are capable of unleashing minions with their own weapons and abilities. God, more than anything, we absolutely need an amphibia video game because these enemies sound like a frustrating blast to fight. Anne runs out of patience and tries to make a break for the museum, bumping into her mom, who already knows what her daughter is up to. In an emotional revelation, we learn that the Thai community gave unconditional support to the Boonjoy family after Anne went missing. They cooked meals for Mr. and Mrs. Boonjoy, presumably because the parents grew extremely depressed and didn't have the energy to cook meals as often. These are the kind of details I've been waiting for. All of the ways the girls' disappearances shook up their respective communities, and how to approach everything now that they're back. Although Anne just keeps casually lying to everyone, which they take at face value. It was just a little misunderstanding. They forgot I was at Dennis camp. However, this intimate moment with the Boontoy family is cut short by the arrival of the Robo Dragonflies. And in a moment akin to Spider-Man 1, the community isn't going to leave Anne and the Planters hanging to fight a swarm of robots on their own. You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us! When one of us is under threat, we all are. 
an action scene that parallels the recent battle in Wartwood, a community standing with someone who may not have been completely honest with them, but still sees past their flaws and offers their support. In the aftermath of the battle, the planters are left exposed, spotted without their disguises, and let me just say, the hyper-realistic planters were splendid. And gets to look at this all day, slime and all. Everyone decides not to press him for answers, but instead rolls with it, telling Anne that if the planters are her friends, then they are friends of the community as well. Now, between the severed robot arm and the wreckage of the dragonflies, I wonder if all of these damaged robot parts will make a comeback, repurposed into different weapons of mass destruction in Spider Sprig, or if some of them will be recovered by the FBI in the episode Mr. X. The episode comes to a close with Dr. Jan's arrival, showing up with the pot in blacklight, eager to inform everyone of the hidden message to which Anne consults Marcy's notes, as the notes hold the alphabet needed to translate. The message reads, Seek the mother of alms. She will guide you to your destiny. I know the captions say alms, but if you translate with the alphabet, it does indeed translate to alms. Now, we already have a good idea of who the mother of the alms is, because we know who the alms in question are. We've already met two alms in Coraler's past, Lysol and Anguin, who mentioned their mom during their fight. Mom always liked me best. That's because she had terrible taste. Needless to say, this will be one of Anne's first objectives once she returns to Amphibia, but she still needs a portal home. And with that, we're finished with the episode. As always, what do you guys think? Which segment did you enjoy more this week? I know usually there can be a clear winner, but these were both two bangers that progressed the story. Let us know your thoughts on everything in the comments down below, or let us know over at Roundable Vids, or me at Autric Fox, over on Twitter and Instagram. If you enjoyed this video, please sure to like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. See ya!